Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Luke Bible Study with Pastor Robert. We hope that you dive deeply into Scripture as you draw nearer to God. Thanks for joining us, and have a great study. Good evening, our Zoomers. Welcome. Good evening, and thanks for joining us tonight. Hope you can hear me. I can see you, and and glad to see your thumbs up tonight. So we're super glad that you could join us along with our live crew tonight for the balance of Luke chapter 12 tonight. So do we have a reader in our live class here, a reader who is willing? I see a a willing hand that went up to read that. We are doing part two of chapter 12 tonight, personal instruction to all disciples, part two, continuation from last week. So if your Bible is open, please to Luke 12 at verse 35. Uh, We'll begin reading at verse 35. And to the balance of the chapter. And if after reading, if you'll open us in a word of prayer and ask for God's blessing, I appreciate that. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. When he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat the male and female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in two and appoint him his fortune with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with you. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. From now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather. And there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you can not discern this time? Yes, and why, even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge. The judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid every last month. (laughs) Father... First of all, we give you all the honor, glory, laud, praise, and worship that you rightfully deserve. Tonight we study more of your word with Pastor Robert. 
And we would ask that the pastor's words reach us all so that we can go forth and relay this message to others who have not heard it before, that they may come to know your son, Jesus, in his everlasting love and his salvation. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that reading and prayer. And we're finishing the chapter tonight and uh, personal instruction to all disciples, part two. There are four major sections on your outline in front of you. Hopefully you've gotten that and have been able to print it. And some of this is new teaching uh, for us. It hasn't been covered in the previous chapters of the Gospel of Luke, and for the disciples as well, too. It was new teaching. So Roman 1 on your outline, ready and waiting, ready and waiting. We start by looking at the parable of the waiting servants. And this is an interesting section because in a little bit more detail, Christ is speaking about the time period when he departs this earth after his ascension and until he comes back at his second coming. He's speaking, of course, you know, to us tonight because we're in that period. We're still in this interim time period between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. But for his disciples, he's speaking to them really picturesquely for the first time on this time period. And of course, without giving any indication of the length of time between his ascension and his return, his second coming. So he uses this picture of the master being away at a wedding and he's going to come back. Now, this time period of Christ being absent was not seen by the Old Testament. This is new teaching for the New Testament, this time period that there's this gap between the two comings of Christ, uh, especially his ascension. So Old Testament believers and Old Testament prophets, they spoke of the, the coming of the Lord, but they didn't see the two comings of Christ first in his birth and then in his coming as a judge. They didn't see the two comings. So that's why this is new material uh, for the disciples and helpful, you know, for us as well, too, because, again, uh, as Jesus taught his disciples, then he's teaching us tonight that we're, we're in a ready and waiting pattern. Uh, we're in this holding pattern, but holding doesn't mean twiddle your thumbs. Uh, in fact, in, in the next section, letter B, it's, you know, it's, it's be busy as a manager. Be, be busy as a, as a household manager or servant and, and get things done. So especially in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, in your notes, this time period also the, the New Testament called as a mystery. Uh, the time between Christ's first and second coming is a mystery. And therein, uh, you know, many of us are, you know, at least uh, familiar with the teaching of the rapture. And that was unseen by the Old Testament, the coming of Christ, even if you call it a half coming. His coming in the air was called a mystery. The Old Testament had no clue uh, that he would come in that way either. So I just wanted to, you know, pique your curiosity, you know, with this text for those reasons. Now, in the text, verse 35, look at your, your scripture. We have several pictures in a row of readiness being ready for the, the return of Christ. Uh, and for us, again, you might think, okay, the return at the rapture or the return at his second coming. You might be thinking of either one of those. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his return, even though, of course, presently he's sitting with them. He's teaching them, right? So that's the uniqueness of that. In verse 35, there's two pictures of readiness. The first one, make sure that you are dressed okay and in the greek it's interesting this or king james might use the make sure your loins are girded that, so this is the the picture of the outer uh robe or cloak that was commonly worn this outer robe or cloak 
while you were in your house, you wouldn't have girded that cloak. But if you were leaving the house to do business or you're going to the next town, you would pull up that outer cloak and tuck it in your belt. That was girding your loins so that you could walk either quicker or you could do business. That's the picture of being ready. It's kind of an interesting picture that way. Make sure you've got your belt on. And of course, this picture of the belt is borrowed then by the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians. How? Yes. Yes. Make sure it's buckled on you. He used the same loins picture there that, that you have in your notes then. The second picture of readiness, keep your what, what? Yes, folks, keep the lights on. Uh, you know, is that Motel 6? Was, is that, did they, are they still in business? Do they? I don't hear that commercial anymore. I used to thought that was kind of a cool commercial. We'll keep the lights on for you. Well, keeping the lights on, of course, is oil lamps, right? In Jesus' context in the first century, oil lamps keep them lit. You would extinguish them at night when you were going to bed, but keeping them lit means what? All night long, keeping them lit. You have to trim the wind and you have to fill it with oil. Sure, sure. After that, what does it mean that it's lit all night long? You're waiting for somebody. That, that you are able at a given moment to get up, move about the house freely and open the door for the person who's coming. You're, you're active. You're ready. So you're not sleeping very well unless you took your PMs, you know, that night, right? Tylenol or whatever. So keep the lamps burning. And then in verse 36, a third picture of readiness that you, you can open the door when the master returns. Now, some of your translations say returning from the wedding banquet. And be careful because this picture right here is not the picture then of the wedding supper of the lamb. Because if it was, that means the disciples weren't part of it. So it's a picture of the master gone away to the wedding. So our reader's translation just said wedding versus wedding banquet. That kind of helped to not create confusion of the wedding supper of the lamb, which is still to come for us and for the disciples. So just look at this question number one. Uh, please, on your outline. Has the length of time between Christ's ascension and expected return ever bothered you, a family member or a friend? Now it's, yeah, we're 2000 and and, uh, so many years later, and we're still asked to be ready and waiting. Anybody care to care to speak on that opening question? Has the length of time ever concerned you? A family member or a friend? Anybody? Uh, not me, because uh, I read the book of Revelation and nothing seemed to be in place yet anyway. Okay. <laughs> now <what> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Please? I thought it would have happened a long time before this, but it hasn't. But when we came back from Thailand in 93, Jerry's dad said it might be another 30 years. Oh. <laughs> well, it's been about 30 years, <laughs> and we're still waiting. And we're still waiting. Okay, I, thanks. I didn't believe it. I was sure, you know, the way the world was, but it's worse now. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Please. With, with all the things that have happened, you wonder, what did he mean by soon? <laughs> okay, that's, that's really fair. This text doesn't use that adverb of time here, but it does in many of the Gospels, right, that he's returning soon. And, and sometimes my, my best, at least at this point of my meager understanding of scripture is it's the next big event in, you know, eschatology or in uh, the calendar of God, you know, his, so the soonness, I mean, we measure soonness in, you know, seven o'clock is coming soon and we say 15 minutes, you know, but the soon in the sense of the next big part of God's plan. That's the best way I've, I've dealt with that adverb of time. Has anybody else had that issue where somebody used it in a scoffing way soon? Well, 2000 years, how soon is soon? If 2000 years have come and gone, has anyone ever dealt with that? Soon is comparative, you know, so what are you comparing it to eternity? Okay. Then it is that, that helps. Then, you know, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That does help. Yeah. Yeah, um, time. Yeah. And well, yeah, so he accommodates us with words of time, 
uh, because it's for our benefit, not for his, of course. How about the second question I listed, if that might spur some discussion? Does Christ's delay cause doubt that he will come anytime soon? There's the word soon that I used. No, good. Yeah. Because for some, it, it, it is a concern. It's a doubt because they're, you know, we're trying to rationalize the time period from when Jesus was here. And right. And some people, it may be an issue of falling away then. Okay. Anyone else on that one? I'm kind of hoping he delays a little bit because there's so many people being saved with missionary work and stuff oh, that's going on. Yeah. <laughs> and mission, new missionaries have moved into tribes. They're learning languages. Yes. They do Bible translation and teaching them. Like, just, just wait a little bit. I've always been anxious about it, but now I'm like, yeah. hey, we got to get some more people saved. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always excited, and I don't know tonight offhand. Maybe somebody else would, but when I hear of, of – um, uh, the the tr- the translator the translator agency to put scripture in into the languages of everybody Wycliffe or such and when I do hear the numbers that are shrinking as far as the people groups that do not have the Bible in their own language yet when I hear that the numbers shrink that to me makes me excited you know because then I think you know the gospel is going to be preached to the whole world and then the end will come so when I hear Wycliffe saying. And I, I, I just won't even dare to venture what the numbers you know, are at this point. I haven't heard it for a while. Please. I would just say that to watch prophecy unfold before your eyes, week after week and month after month, yeah. and instead of doubt, it would cause you more belief that this yeah. is really going to happen sometime. It, it solidifies it. That's a great word. That's great. Thanks. So in verse 37... It's interesting that Jesus addresses his disciples then and says that in this time period, they are to act then like whom or like what? How are they to act in the time period when he's gone? They are to act like servants. servants. Does everybody see the term? This is the, the Greek term for a bond slave of which Christ came to serve, not to be served. That's what he's calling his 12 disciples to be as servants in this time period. So our readiness and our waiting is not a passivity. It is to be a full engagement uh, in what the master has entrusted each one of us to do. So I like that term uh, in, in um, you know, Matthew uh, 20, verse 28, right? Jesus came, he used the own term, not to be served, but to serve. That's the verb, uh, same thing as the noun here, servants. And the, the, the servants who are waiting and are ready are going to receive a blessing um, or NIV. It'll be good for them. That's the Greek word uh, for beatitude or a macarism um, that we had in Matthew uh, chapter 5, the uh, beatitudes. Luke chapter 6 had them as well, too. So there's a blessing. This is incredible. I mean, I... I <laughs> I can't get my head around verse uh, 37 in particular. What is the blessing that the servants of Jesus receive uh, when when they are ready and waiting for the master to return? What's the blessing, verse 37? They'll be served by the master. Incredible. The master will serve the servants. Does everybody get this? Now, Jesus Christ modeled that, of course, uh, in what way on the, the last week of his life? Yes. When, when he took his outer cloak off, which, you know, he would have girded about his loins. He took that off and put on a towel and washed his feet. Right. He served his disciples. And so the wedding, the wedding supper of the lamb, we see that very same picture happening. This, uh, you know, I do love that theological term, then the condescension of God. It's not that God looks down, you know, off his nose at us. It's the point that God becomes the lowest for our sakes. So at the wedding supper that he seats us at his table and serves the meal to us who are the servants. That's the blessing, brothers and sisters, that we long for and and wait for. And boy, is that beef roast with gravy going to be good? Or maybe it's vegetarian. I don't know. I don't know, but it just, there's the blessing. That is a powerful, powerful picture. The macarism or the beatitude is repeated in verse 38. 
it will be good or you, you will be blessed if you're ready at all times. The second watch of the night was 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. So we ourselves are not even in it yet tonight. The third watch of the night, 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. And, and the believer is watching when other people normally aren't is the picture because all of them are fast asleep. But that's why the picture of the oil lamp, keep it burning. That way, at a given second, you can get up and, and receive the master, you know, at the door and such. There's a constant awareness on a believer's heart and mind to be ready for the return of Jesus. A constant, we live with that. We live with that. Even with the, the tension of soonness and with the uh, amount of years and centuries that have already passed. So uh, then there's another picture, a fourth picture of readiness in verse 39. Uh, in, in the sense of if, if you had a tip that somebody was going to break into your home, you, you'd be up with a flashlight and ready to shine it on his face as soon as he broke through the window or the door, right? See, the readiness of, 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 for the thief, and you'll foil his plans in this sense. Uh, but there's our next picture of readiness. And thus an exhortation, very simply, verse 40, the exhortation, be ready. So we have that in verse 35. We have it as a bookend in verse 40. Be ready. Christ is returning at an unknown hour. In fact, does Jesus himself know the hour he's returning? The answer is, yeah, we know, we know that already. Matthew 24, 36. Not even the son of man knows the hour he's returning. Only the, the father. And the father will dispatch Jesus and say, now's the time. Right. And then Jesus will come and uh, bring us back to himself. So let's go to letter B, the parable of the managers. This one is really interesting. The parable of the managers. So serving, serving, being a household servant is what it means to be ready. Uh, So we're in verse 41. This little parable answers who needs to be ready, who needs to be ready. So Peter's question in verse 41, to whom is this parable spoken? Peter asks, is it spoken to us as the disciples? And, you know, there's some sense of, well, that they were entrusted as the 12 disciples. I mean, they're kind of, you know, in that position of leadership. Maybe the readiness only has to do with those who are in charge of certain things. So he asks the question, uh, who should be ready? Is it all of us uh, or is it just some of us? And uh, the disciples as leaders, of course, you know, need to be ready. But if you'll just glance down to verse 48, just look at verse 48. I'm kind of looking at the language that Jesus used at the close, the second half of verse 48. And it seems he repeats both answers uh, or he answers Peter with both groups. So from everyone who has been given much, see, there's the wide group, everyone, much will be demanded. And from the single person, from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So the answer to Peter's question is everybody needs to be ready, not just people in ministry, not just the 12 disciples. Everybody should have this readiness uh, on, the, on their minds and on their hearts at all times. Okay. Now, this, this text does have a couple of complications. So let's talk about two approaches to this parable that you see then in your outline, and I left you a a large amount of notes. Um, So there are two, uh, the first approach to this text is that the text is only speaking of two managers in two different categories. The first manager is the faithful one in verse 42, and the second manager or second category is the unfaithful manager in verse 45. And then verses 47 to 48b amplify the second manager, the unfaithful manager in verse 45. That's the first approach to this text. There's Jesus is only speaking about two people, one faithful, one not faithful. And then the unfaithful manager gets some amplified uh, 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 speaking from Jesus. The basis for this approach to the text is that the NIV in particular has a paragraph break After verse 46, if you're using the NIV tonight, I'm curious. Now, I don't know of more recent versions of the NIV, 
But in the older versions of the NIV, there's a paragraph break after verse 46. This paragraph break, though, is not found in King James, ESV, or NAS. The paragraph break, unfortunately, you understand the Greek text has no paragraph breaks. Of course, you also understand the Greek text has no verse numbers. Does everybody know that? So the editors of the NIV are suggesting something about the text. When they put the paragraph break in the text between 46 and 47, they're suggesting a break in the thought. There are two managers, one faithful, one not. And now Jesus will go on to explain the unfaithful manager with more description. That's what they're suggesting. But that's an editor of the Bible. It's not coming from scripture itself. The problem with this approach to understanding this text is reconciling the punishment for the unfaithful manager in verse 46 being cut to pieces. And looking at verse 47, a different punishment is mentioned. If it's the same guy, this one is only beaten with many blows. And it does seem odd that if he's cut in pieces, you're still beating him with a stick. Do, do you see? That's the, that's the problem of this only two people are being addressed approach to the text. That's not the approach I'm going to take tonight. So we look then at uh, approach number two in your outline. Approach number two. I believe a better way to understand this scripture is that there are, in fact, four managers, four managers that Jesus speaks about in this text. One of them is faithful in verse 42, and three of them are unfaithful, three of them. And they're described in different ways of unfaithfulness in verse 45, 47, and 48. They're described differently. The terms are different. For instance, the punishment terms, right? One of them is cut to pieces. The next two are beaten, but not in the same way. One of them is beaten with many blows and the other one beaten with few. The punishment differences alone suggest to me these are different types of unfaithful managers, Not everybody, thank goodness, not everybody's unfaithfulness has the same consequence. Okay, now I liken this. It makes sense to me because of if you remember when we talked about um, the soils in Luke chapter eight, there were four soils. One of them happened to be good. The other three happened to have problems where the seed never developed and bore fruit, remember? So I, I, if I'm fair in making that comparison here, I see four managers. One is good. Three of them have problems with their readiness and their service, okay? So now the basis for this approach to the text, the basis for it is the adversative conjunction, but... This is, this is typed in your notes, so you didn't have to write any of that down, right? Is everybody finding that? The adversative conjunction, which is the word but. That word appears in verse 45 for the first unfaithful manager, right? Verse 45. But, see, he's in contrast to the faithful manager. Then in verse 47, the, the word but is in the Greek text, but the NIV did not translate it. So if you're using NIV tonight and you're looking at verse 47, the word but does not show up in the English translation. That's a fault of the NIV. They didn't translate it. It's in the Greek text. So that's the s- verse 47. King James, I think, has the conjunction and. So King James in translated the conjunction, but they translated it uh, with a connective instead of a contrast. The same Greek word could be translated and or but on occasion. So the King James at least translated it. 
but not in the way that I think it should be. I think verse 47 is the second unfaithful manager. And then in verse 48, again, the NIV put the word but. And that's the third unfaithful manager in contrast to the faithful guy. So how many of you did I lose? That's why I just left it typed out. So you know what, folks? I mean, some very important texts like these, we, we just got to dig deeper and, you know, we, we got to say, Holy Spirit, help me to look at Jesus' words here carefully because I don't want to miss a word. I don't want to miss a word. So here we go. So now we look at each of the four managers. Let's look verse by verse. Verse 42, the faithful manager. This Greek term for manager, do any of you have an overseer, verse 42, or is, does everybody have steward? Some of you have steward or manager. This is actually a slave or servant in the household, but he is of a higher rank. He is an entrusted slave or servant. He is given responsibility. Not everybody in the household has the same responsibility, correct? In the same way in this church and every church. Not everybody, even on pastoral staff, has the same responsibility. So this faithful manager is the lead servant, I would call him. He's still a servant, but he's the lead servant. He oversees the distribution of what for the other servants? Verse 42. Primarily, he's distributing food, which could happen either daily, weekly, or monthly. He makes sure the other servants are fed so that they keep doing their work. He would oversee the work that they're doing. And this faithful manager receives, again, a macarism or a beatitude in verse 43, a blessing when the master returns and finds him discharging his responsibilities. Folks, the, the, this is so important for us in the church because waiting, waiting suggests to us often a passivity. I'm sitting in my chair waiting out and looking out the window for Jesus. That's false. This is where it shows us that we are meant to be servants who are engaged in work. That's what receives the macarism or the blessing. So the the term beatitude in Greek uh, is macarism. That's where that word comes from. So we are 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 being uh, bid by Jesus to be engaged to be, to be folks. I mean, if I hit ninety, I'm still got my sleeves rolled up and I'm serving. I'm doing the work Christ has called me to. See. Uh, that's what waiting and ready means. So the first half of the text that we had tonight, waiting and ready, is now defined as being a servant who is engaged with the responsibility entrusted to me. Okay, And in fact, the master is so pleased with this servant that in verse 44, what does he also give to this servant? Verse 44. Responsibility. Additional responsibility because you have been found trustworthy when the master's gone and his eyes you know, weren't immediately on you. You are entrusted with caring for all of his property. What's exciting about this is when we get to Luke chapter 19, verse 17 in your notes, the parable of the talents. Um, this is where Luke alone, Matthew and Mark don't do this with the parable, say the master is so pleased with you as a servant that he entrusts to you 10 cities. Why is that significant? Because in the millennium and beyond, some of you as faithful servants will be ruling in Christ's place over literal cities. You will be responsible over property and people and goods and services in the glory of the millennial kingdom. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. I mean, who in this town is ever going to elect me mayor? <laughs> well, finally, yeah, some, nobody. But Jesus says, I'm going to entrust to you. Some of you will get two cities. Some of you five. Some of you ten. Because you were faithful as a manager. I mean, that's to me overwhelming. Oh, there's nothing boring about the millennial kingdom or about eternity. 
if you are serving and ruling in Christ's place over cities and over people. There's nothing boring about that. Not at all, right? It's like, what am I going to do for all eternity? I've heard people say that, right? Well, be faithful now because that is the basis then when the master comes back. Well, friends, so far, now let's go at verse 45. We look at the first unfaithful manager. Let's look at the first unfaithful manager. I call manager number one who is unfaithful, I call him reckless defiance. This is what I call him, because I I want to try to get a little handle on each of the three unfaithful managers. So for me, when I looked at him, I say, this guy to me spells out reckless defiance. In verse 45, he is unconcerned of when the master returns. He doesn't care the least. He beats the slaves, which means he's abusing his authority and his power and trusted to him. He is self-indulgent. How? How? What does the text say? Yes, it's all about me. I'm going to eat till I throw up. I'm going to get drunk till I pass out. It's all about him. And, And that's why he's reckless and he's defiant. Verse 46 The master will come when he doesn't expect him. And the punishment is the most severe. It makes me cringe. It is the most severe you can find in Holy Scripture that this servant is cut to pieces. He is dismembered. And whether you want to argue literalness or non-literalness is not going to be our point tonight. But go to the rest of what the master says about this servant. That the master will assign this person with what group of people? That term means he is 100% detached from the master and in an unsaved condition and position. Assigned with the unbelievers, you have no relationship whatsoever with the master any longer. This is the severest judgment and punishment. We say this is a sign to hell. This manager who is unfaithful, number one, defiantly will not do what's entrusted to him. He's self-indulgent. He beats people. He abuses his authority and his power. And he will be assigned to hell. And in the context of uh, Jesus' first century, it might have been the false teachers. It might have been the Pharisees. And, you know, they might have been in this category. They defiantly did not do, of course, what God had called them to do. They did their own thing. And we, we read the woes um, about the religious leaders a couple of chapters ago. Okay. Pastor, Please. Is, uh, some people thought this, this is a, a parallel between the saved people and unsaved people before Christ comes. Okay. It, 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 so this person is being assigned because he never believed that at all. Yep. And the, and, the, and the good servant is the one who does believe. Right. They believe. Right. And that is parallel with Joseph's life in many ways. Joseph? So I'm not, is that a right way of someone viewing that? I think so. Let's look at the other two unfaithfuls, though. Let's look at all three unfaithfuls in a, in a context. Okay. And then, then maybe we can draw another conclusion there. Verse 47, unfaithful manager number two, unfaithful manager number two. Everybody's in verse 47. I call this guy consciously disobedient. I I think he is different than the defiant recklessness of the first guy. He is consciously, he knows what he's supposed to do. And uh, Romans, another uh, text of scripture, he who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins he's consciously disobedient consciously or willfully and and willfully that's fair he's willfully he knows what's right and he won't do what's right now there is overlap of course with the first guy but the second guy doesn't exhibit the recklessness and the defiance of the first guy the second guy doesn't beat the slaves he doesn't drink to excess he's you know that that's not the point of it yes so he verse 47 he knows the masters well yet he doesn't obey and the punishment for him is different he's not cut into pieces he is not assigned a place with the unbelievers he's beaten though with what 
this tells me the discipline or the, the judgment of God upon somebody who is still in relationship with the master. He is still in relationship with the master, but because of his willful knowledge of what he should do and he didn't do it, he receives judgment or loss of reward, we would say in that sense, right? He receives, you know, he's the guy who's, you know, cleaning the the toilet bowls in heaven with a toothbrush. But it doesn't say that he's disconnected from the master. And I think that's the critical part. This is why I think there are three unfaithful managers because of the differences in the judgments and so forth. So then you go to verse 48, unfaithful manager number three. This guy is different yet from number two and number one. He's ignorantly disobedient. He doesn't know. This, this may be somebody who, who is not a church member. He's not heard the gospel. He's never been told he's to act as a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his uh, neighbors and community. He's never been told to love God and love others. Now, you know, we'll be careful with all of these, you know, differences here. By the way, verse 47 could really be a church person, right? Could really be a church person who knows the good he should do, but he just doesn't do it. Sits in churches and hears the gospel and the word of God preached faithfully every week. He just doesn't do it. Okay. He believes it, but he doesn't do it. Do you see? But yeah. he's still a believer, right? That's right. I haven't. So, yeah. It doesn't say he's assigned with the unbelievers. Yes, so, folks, this is where. Undis- undiscipled, maybe, or somebody who doesn't get into the word is more. Well, now, are you talking number two or number three? Number two. Okay, let's get to number three. We already did number two. See, no, yeah, number two doesn't know. He doesn't know. Is there a person who's gone through their whole life or so forth and will, you know, will get to the issues of, you know, you have to hear the gospel but you be saved. But in this case, there's somebody who doesn't know what he should do and he's beaten with fewer blows. I think the contrast is, is significant. The terms are important, which says there's accountability for everybody. That's what this text says. Based on the exposure of light and truth that's been given to you. Yes. We are all differently accountable. Now, by the way, brothers and sisters on Zoom and everybody in the live class, tonight you are that much more accountable to the word of God and to the obedience of Jesus Christ because of the teaching of this text. More light has been given to us tonight. We are now more accountable. So this is not a good reason to drop out of Bible study so you have less accountability to Jesus someday. Right? Right? See, but it's degrees. It's degrees. So there, there is unfaithfulness, which looks different in God's eyes. And the three of them illustrate that uh, for us then. Okay, please. I don't know if you remember, but that was many years ago when I was sitting down reading the Bible and I read that I would be responsible yeah. if I knew more. Right. I the yeah, she closed it and stopped. Yeah. Okay. Pastor Let's Robert, please. Uh, as, as a pastor myself, I looked at these verses and I said, I have to be careful yeah. that I'm not one of the disobedient or even the defiant. Right. Or, or I will receive a, a greater punishment. Right. Because God has placed me in, in a place of responsibility. Yeah. He, he calls you to a place of responsibility and thus to whom much is given, much is required. So, so the degree of responsibility is different among every believer and every person. Okay. So now I I give you question number two at your tables. This is for discussion at zoom together and at your tables. Now question two, where are you currently serving Christ in your church or community? This is at your table. Are you confident if the master returns today that he would bless your current service for him? And what's your next step in faithful service to Jesus? So take a couple minutes at your tables and talk about those things, you know, in a more personal setting amongst yourselves, okay? But I, I've been praying. praying okay, bond servants, let's come back together.
I hope that was a fruitful discussion and encouraging at your table to spur one another on as we wait for Jesus. We're active and we're, we're rolling up our sleeves and we're getting dirty, right? We're getting messy. So let's go to part two. We've got some rich scripture yet to cover for tonight, please. Part two, the mission of Jesus. I'm going to ask our reader to read for us again the first three verses of this section, 49, 50, and 51. So let your eyes look at the next section of Holy Scripture. Let's read again 49, 50, and 51, please, so that we can uh, start with that. I came to send fire on the earth. How I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. Question number three, please, on your outline. Why are the words of Jesus in these three verses difficult for us to understand, interpret, and apply? Please. Prince of Peace. I, I, I knew him as the Prince of Peace, but now he's not coming to give peace. Thank you. That's helpful. Someone else. Why, is, why are these three verses tough? What baptism Okay. I, I, I know the term baptism. I see it, but all of a sudden I know he was already baptized by John the Baptist. So what is he using this term for? What does that mean? Thank you. Someone else, please. Folks, this is hard. The, the, these, these scriptures are hard because, put in your own words. Because they're true. Okay, they're true. They're not the simple gospel verses that we love to uh, sink into. You know, they're not the John, this, these are not the John 316 words that refresh us and keep a smile on our faces, right? The, these, these are not the love of Jesus, that Jesus loves me, this I know verses. See, and we, we tend to cling much closer, for good reason, to those types of scripture verses. So when we get to these, it's like, oh, please don't preach on these, right? It, it's, it's not the familiar ones. The, the, these are difficult verses because of keywords. Verse 49, so as uh, Pastor Adam does so helpful for us, you know, if you had your scripture journals, verse 49, you'd want to look at the word fire and you want to look at the phrase kindled already. Jesus wants a bonfire now. When Jesus when he went and preached that his in Nazareth, he opened the scroll and he read all of it. Uh -huh. And right then and there, it brought division in the whole situation. <laughs> yeah, he sure did. And they wanted to take Mount Strong over the hill yeah. because he told it that he is your state. His being Messiah, claiming to be Messiah, has brought division in the Jewish community big time. In our own communities, too. The, uh, the fire is burning. And in our own families. Verse 50, the word baptism. And the word distressed, the verb, or its, its counterpart straightened, uh, maybe King James has there. Verse 51, not peace, but division. So in each of these verses, we have two key words or verbs, nouns or verbs that are just difficult. So here we go. Verse 49, first look at the phrase, I have come. This verb is important this verb, because this verb is frequently used in the Gospels to describe a part of Christ's mission. I have come. The Father has sent me. I have come to do this and that. Now, in your outline, I've got scriptures that are familiar to you. And if I begin them, you'll be able to finish them because they're all verses that use the verb I have come. They describe the mission of Jesus. Matthew 9, verse 13. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's part of Christ's mission. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. I have not come to be served, 
but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. That's part of Christ's mission. Luke 19, verse 10, we're coming to it in a couple of weeks. I have come to seek and to save the lost. And in John 9, verse 39, this is one we don't know, so I'm going to ask you to turn to it. Because this is the one that helps me understand our verse tonight. This one is not familiar to most of us as part of the mission of Christ. So look at it as you turn in your Bible to John 9, verse 39. And when you found it, throw your hand in the air if you care to read it for us. We, yeah, okay, so everybody found it? Have you all found John 9, 30? This is important to understand the Luke text we're in right now. So please go ahead and read for us John 9, 39. For judgment, I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Okay, so this is not the favorite verse we go to about the mission of Jesus, that he's also come for this dividing line type of judgment, right? And there's always and only in scripture, two groups of people, those who are for Christ and those who are against Christ. But that verse in particular really parallels what Luke is recording about Jesus. Now, um, in John chapter 10, verse 10, that one we know as well too, and you can finish quoting, right? Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. See, we know the very positive verses about the mission of Jesus. Those are the ones that we cling to because they encourage us and motivate us. But it's the other ones as far as every time that Christ is coming into the world, there is a division. It's the other half of what Christ is coming to do because unfortunately and very sadly, right, the whole world will not be saved. There is no such thing as a universalism. That's false doctrine. Unitarian universalist churches. It's false doctrine. There is not 100% salvation. Um, and and we, we don't adhere to that. Scripture doesn't even teach that. So here we have in verse 49, Jesus saying that I have come. The, the verb indicating mission. This is part of his mission to bring fire on the earth and his desire that this fire would come already. Now, the King James, it's interesting. They phrase this as a question. And what will I, if it be already kindled? It's not an easy phrase in King James, but the King James worded the phrase as a question. So those of you working with King James and New King James, make sure to check other uh, translations, you know, to get sense of that. The question of the fire is, does Jesus want a fire that purifies or does Jesus want a fire that brings destruction? The only way you can answer this is context. Are we in the context of Luke 12 that shows he's bringing purity to people or are we in the context of showing that there's destruction which is coming to people? And if you'll consider the three unfaithful managers, two of which get beaten uh, in different ways, and the one which gets dismembered, we're in the context of the destructiveness of what Christ's gospel even comes to accomplish. And so we look here, and in verse 51, I believe the term division is the term that qualifies what the fire is all about. So in the context, the immediate context, the word division – would qualify for us. This is not a purifying kind of a fire. This is a kind of a fire, of course, which brings a judgment or a destruction. And we are in the context of the unfaithful managers. Now, Luke chapter 3, verse 17 was really important for me as I, I wrestled with these verses for a long time. If you care to look at Luke 3, verse 17, I think the Holy Spirit helped me understand Jesus' heart in this hard verse from a previous verse in Luke, Luke 3, verse 17, where John the Baptist says about Jesus, Luke 3, 17, that his winnowing fork is already in his hand. And a farmer who has a winnowing fork is doing two things at the same time, right? He's separating what from what? 
He's doing two things. One is very blessed. He's bringing the wheat to his barn, but the winnowing fork at the same time as it's separating wheat from chaff is separating the chaff from the wheat that it might be what? Burned Burned with unquenchable fire. I think that verse answers and helps me understand the difficulty of Luke chapter 12 here. I've come to bring a fire and how I wish that it were kindled already. This is the other half of the winnowing, the wheat and the chaff. Then we look, please, at verse 50, because that's the first of the three verses, which are a little tough. Baptism. I have a baptism to undergo, and I'm distressed until it's completed. Now, this is not a water baptism. Why? Right here now. Jesus was already baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, Luke chapter 1, verse 21. So after the winnowing uh, message of John the Baptist, John the Baptist baptized Christ. So here, this picture of baptism, and I am going to use the word then, immersed into something. Immersed into something. Christ is being immersed, and, and I think here, if we can look at this picture, into the divine plan that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all created in eternity past, the divine plan for the suffering and the crucifixion of Christ. He's being immersed into this portion of this activity of God who will go to death for sinful humans. He's being immersed into it in this chapter. See? So he has a baptism to undergo, and it does create, I'm a little bit nervous about the translation distress because that almost, for me, we use the term distress, and I think more often in a sinful way. And Christ cannot be in sinful emotions of distress. He cannot be sinfully distressed. So as I look at this particular word, there were many other translations, ESV and NAS use, I'm, I, I'm under constraint. That helped me because there is a divine plan which he will not deviate from. How, how I wish that this, you know, because he sees the suffering that's coming and his humanity coils against it. It does, right? It coils against it because he knows the suffering that's coming. So this constraint, King James used straightened or confined in the sense of he cannot go outside of it. Lord, if you can take this cup from me, but the divine answer was no. Uh, he, when he was on his way to Jerusalem for the last time, he said he set his face as a flint. Yep. Determination to accomplish God's will, but it was not easy. Determined. Yeah, that helps here. So I, I'm a little nervous about the word distress because I think for us that verb typically includes some worry or sin. And we cannot assign that to Jesus, you know, but he recognizes the pressure of what's coming as a human being because he's been in every situation like unto us, except without sin. Okay, so the Greek verb distressed, impelled. I'm occupied. I cannot get off thinking of the salvation of people. I'm absorbed. I'm under duress. These were all verbs, uh, translations from this same verb here. So all of Jesus' emotional energy is directed at accomplishing salvation for you. All of it. Every bit of his angst. And uh, Hebrews chapter five, verse seven, during the days of Jesus life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. See, and this is one of these moments. This is where we see uh, he has this baptism to undergo and he's constrained by it until it's completed. There's no other way around the salvation plan, but he's that close to it and it's coming. I picture kind of like a valley with yeah. steep sides, and you can't go that, to one side or the other. You must go through that straight, that means narrow. That's helpful. It's like a narrow, like a canyon, and he has to go yep. through it. You have to go through it. That's very, very helpful word picture. Then verse 51, 
<laughs> this one, right? Because the Prince of Peace, the, the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7. I came not for peace, but for division. Well, this kind of helps uh, qualify for us to the uh, angel's message, you know, peace on earth, good will toward men. And, you know, that one, that is a tough one, right? Because it's, there's no universal peace, you know, in this world that comes. The peace comes because people submit themselves to Jesus Christ. That's where the peace comes that the angels talk about. People humble themselves, repent of sin, receive Christ as Savior and Lord, submit to him. Then there's peace between me and the holy God, right? When I confess sin and ask Christ to be my Savior, that's the only time that there's peace. But a universal peace in this world, right? Peace, peace, but there is no peace, the Old Testament prophets said, but division. Now, in verse 51 and following, Micah chapter 7, verse 6, is the background for what Jesus is quoting And Micah also spoke of the division that would come in three categories, father and son, mother and daughter, and mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. Micah 7 verse 6 used the same three categories. But it's interesting that Luke, when he did a research this part of Jesus' life, and Jesus said these words, he reverses uh, or flips every one of them and doubles them. Father against son in Micah's prophecy is also son against father. The division is so deep. It's so deep in every individual member of the family. So the prophecy of Micah is doubled uh, by what Jesus has to say here in these three categories. Um, so, so Christ, we know from the Old Testament, uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13, He's a sanctuary to those who flee to him, but he's also a stumbling stone. So the Old Testament already knew this, that Jesus would be the division between people. Either you come to him and uh, trust him as Savior and Lord, or you crash you know, by, on him as, as the rock would, would squish you. And Luke chapter 2, we've heard this from Simeon. Remember Simeon who took the baby Jesus in his arms? Luke chapter 2, verse 34 and 35, Christ will cause, are you ready to remember this? The falling and rising of many in Israel. So this division was already prophesied, right? You're either with him or you're not. Um, And and that the heart, the, um, the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, the fact that you, you, you can't hide from God what you're thinking about Jesus. You can't hide that. Jesus is the dividing point of every single person on the face of the earth. He is the dividing point. And you'll either be with him or for him. And, and, and your drawing near to Christ will cause family members to withdraw from you, is what we see. You, you, you're claiming Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, right? You're drawing nearer to God will cause a division where people in your family will back away from you. And, and I know, you know, some of you, of course, have experienced that, um, you know, firsthand. So question number four, please, on your outline. This is at your tables only, again, you know, so that you can receive encouragement from one another and prayers from one another and Zoomers. Question four, how have you dealt with division in your family because of Jesus? So, Take a few minutes, please, to uh, share with one another as you're able to and and to ask for, you know, prayer for for these issues that you might currently be dealing with. And then we'll come back together. This what I've done is just prayed. So I have members. Um. I, we sent our children to a Christian school in junior high, and um, one of them right now says he doesn't believe in Jesus anymore, and, and it's really hard to see that, even though he was educated in it. Um, and all I can do, I guess, is pray, continue to pray for him that he'll remember what he was taught in those schools, and he'll see what his mother and I are doing. Is that Nathan? Yes. Yeah. It's interesting though too, because now just recently, 
he sent his kids to a Christian school. Uh -huh. So now I'm, now I'm like, um, now I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> In a good way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, you know, I get it. He wants his kids to be away from, you know, all the things they're indoctrinating children with nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, um, initially, he had them going to a, um, more of a, Christ, uh, a Christian school, St. John's, I think it was, in Berlin. Yeah. But then he had a fallen out with somebody there, so then he turned around and sent them to a Catholic school, and it's like, well, I wasn't quite in agreement with them going to the Catholic school, but it's better than a public school. Right. Yeah, that's true. But, yeah, it, it leaves me with a lot of questions of where is he really at, you know, with, with Jesus. Huh. And I, I don't know. I know he understands about the scriptures, at least from what he learned in school. And, yeah, Bruce's dad, when we, we got saved, he was just so, I don't know, it's so hard to explain the attitude that he had. And, you know, and he kind of asked Bruce, you know, um, oh, no, the first time that we encountered how how he was against about what we believe is when we uh, bought the house in red granite and he gave us the money and he said to us uh i just want you to know that this came from me and not from your god oh uh, uh, I, I, I told i told bruce take give the money back to him and we we can survive folks we're going to give you one minute to wrap up one minute and and he uh you know bruce bruce didn't want to even make him madder that it'll be so hard for us to witness to him, you know. Uh -huh. yeah. So it, it, it's just so sad. It just broke my heart of, of how he uh, arrogant he was about the money situation, you know. And and we never did stop praying for him and everything and. You know, I just pray that the last time, the last minute of his breathing, that he uh, had the chance to really, you know, mm -hmm. come to God. Try, yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I it, only God knows what happened in his heart, whether he did or not, because you know we never stopped telling him that here we go let's uh, come together if we can i hope the conversation you added your table you know would help make connections if if you're experiencing the difficulty of division in your own family you know that you can ask for support uh from somebody at your table or somebody uh, via zoom we're going to part three then on our outlines, which is a very tiny part. I, I gave you nothing uh, typed into your outline for it. It is just a very small section. In fact, it's interesting that this little section included here is, is not so much um, a, a personal teaching Jesus is giving to the disciples, but notice that his attention has changed, verse 54, to the, to the crowd. So the disciples are still here in the earshot, but this is kind of interesting that uh that th this little section jesus you know says that you know people m make uh judgments on things every day which are very very obvious um things that are obvious they make judgments on and make conclusions about so in verse 54 if um you know you care about your farm and your garden and so forth you look and see a cloud that's coming from the west and in israel the cloud is coming from where then? What's west of Israel? The body of water. Mediterranean. The Mediterranean Sea. This is see, if you see the cloud coming, it's like, whoo, this is good news that we're gonna get some rain. rain that's coming from the Mediterranean Sea. An obvious fact and a conclusion. Uh, people know how to make 
uh, some judgments off of obvious facts. There's a, there's a cloud coming and it's coming from the West. That means rain is going to come. Verse 55. Oh, the wind is coming and the wind is now coming from the South, which means what about the wind? Yeah, it's coming from the, the, the desert, Arabia. It's going to be hot, 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 dry, and it's going to wither and wilt everything. So it's an obvious fact when the, the wind is coming from the south in Israel, uh, the, the air is coming from the desert, it's going to be a hot and dry day. And G- Jesus says, you know, I appreciate the fact that you, you make uh, judgments about obvious things, right? I appreciate the fact that you can read weather clouds and wind as far as its direction, but he calls them hypocrites. Why? Why? They don't understand what's happening right in front of them because that's the logical fulfillment of the Messiah coming. See, you can't see that. This is so interesting here because, you know, Jesus, see, the obvious weather phenomena you can make correct conclusions about The obvious thing here is that Jesus is the Messiah. The conclusion is submit to him as Lord and Savior. But they won't do it. That's why he calls them hypocrites. The obvious thing, the works of Christ have demonstrated that he is the Messiah who has been prophesied and promised. But you won't make the conclusion then that I should receive him as Lord and Savior. That's why they're hypocrites. He takes this obvious judgment or obvious conclusions that they make about weather. And he attaches that then to what's right before their eyes. And so we see a hardness of their will. This, you know, calling them a hypocrite, we'd see a hardness of people's will. They don't want to receive Christ, repent of sin, and turn from their own ways. It's a hardness of their will that refuses to conclude that Christ is God with us, right? They had signs, so they knew the scriptures. So yep. they had that, and they did yep. miracles. They had the prophecy. Teaching that he gave them, you know, yep. that they willfully turned. They had John the Baptist, yep. I mean, you had everything in front of you, and they willfully turned away. So that little section, Interpreting the Times, Christ applied it in that way. So let's finish tonight with part four, settling accounts. This is really an interesting set of tiny little verses here, because notice the, the, the question, almost a, an invitation or a statement that Jesus makes in verse 57. So why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? I mean, if you can see clouds from the West and you know it's going to rain, why can't you make a right decision about me? You see, it, it's an invitation. It's, it's in the form of a question. But, you know, you, you're able to put two and two together on these other matters and subjects. So why not make a right conclusion and decision about me? It, it's in the form of a question. It's, it's almost an invitation. And now we have here this really unique Little, some people call it a parable uh, about settling accounts. The word parable doesn't appear here, but there's many folks who do. And in verse 58, there are five characters in the parable. I need to make sure you see each one of them. So let's walk through the five characters in this teaching of Jesus about accounts or parables. Start me off in verse 58. So, yep, before that, you missed one. The person yourself. You, you yourself. You yourself. Number one. Number two, the adversary. Number three. This is interesting. See, in in, in Jewish culture, see, there's a couple of steps. The magistrate is the civil leader or governor or ruler or mayor. He's That's the civil person. So, apparently... Legal issues might have started first with the mayor of the town. Okay, so that's number three. Then we go to number four. The judge. judge. See, now you get to the court person. Uh, The magistrate obviously says, yep, this is worthy. You better go to court. So we got the fourth person. And lastly, the fifth person. Does everybody have the term officer twice in verse 58 at the end? Yes. This is a unique Greek term this term officer it sounds very generic to us in english but this guy is like the debt collector 
This is a financial term. The officer is a term for somebody who would collect taxes. And if you did not pay your taxes on January 31st in Washer County, you've got to pay them July 31st in Washer County or the financial officer, the debt collector will come after you. Correct. Does everybody get that? The term is very, very specific. That's why the last term repeated twice officer will take you and throw you into debtor's prison because you have not paid the price. See, that's where the theme for the entire thing comes from. You owe a debt and the accuser comes after you and is dragging you to get this settled. And that's where all of the other legal people come into the picture of this little teaching or story. Settle an account is what we're after here. Now, there are three important assumptions that this teaching makes that I hope I can share with you this way. And this time I, I'll let you to do shorthand. Three important assumptions about this important teaching. Number one, you, verse 58, as you are going with your adversary, you are guilty of debt. The teaching assumes this. You are going with the adversary to the mayor and then to the, the judge, the legal guy. It already assumes that you are guilty of debt. That's assumption number one. And you are culpable before a judge. That's why he first takes you to the mayor. The mayor says, yep, take him to the judge. That's the assumption of the teaching. Everybody got that? I think that one made sense, right? Number two, unless you reconcile with your accuser, unless you reconcile with the accuser before you get to court, you will be found guilty and imprisoned. That's assumption number two. Unless you reconcile, you settle with your accuser before you get to court, the assumption is you will be found guilty and you will be in prison. Does everybody see where this tiny little teaching is going? The assumptions of the tiny teaching here are huge. So sometimes, yeah, I'm saying what, what the teaching is bringing to us, you know, you have to read behind the words to understand this, you know. They're already going to the legal people, which means you've got a problem that you will not get out of if you don't settle it before you get there. Because once you get there, it's over. The assumption is you will go to prison. Number three, assumption number three, the point of paying the last penny or the last might. Did I hear that right from the reading? Yeah. The point, listen carefully, because this is where false doctrine reigns in this verse. The point of paying the last penny is that you are held responsible for the debt. Not that release is ever possible. Otherwise, this is where you will get a false doctrine of purgatory that you can pay out. Or a false doctrine of hell that once you've paid for your sin or your crime, you can get out. That's not the point of the text. Neither does the rest of scripture bear out that you can get out of hell or get out of your debt. The, the assumption of the text, the point of paying the last penny is that you are culpable and responsible. You're held responsibility. Not that release is ever possible. The text never suggests that you can actually get to the point of paying the last penny. Now, verse 58, look at the text as we're wrapping up here in closing. There are two options for you that Jesus explains. This is really important. We need to see the words of the text. There are two options. Don't forget Jesus' invitation in verse 57 is that we make a right decision, that we make a right decision choice that we judge what is correct because if i don't make the correct choice the outcome of the other option is deadly so option number one 
reconcile on the way with your adversary, right? As you are going with your adversary to the magistrate, here's option number one. Try hard to be reconciled to him on the way. Does everybody have that language? Can you see that in your text? Settle out of court. Settle out of court is is a nice synopsis uh, of that, right? Because if you get to court, you will not get out of court. You will not be found. There won't be a technicality that lets you off. You will be in prison if you go if you go to court. OK, so option number one, reconcile, settle. Now, option number two, be imprisoned. Option number two, be imprisoned. That's it. Now, make a right choice. Make a right decision. Settle the account now or be imprisoned. That's what this tiny little teaching is inviting us with. And I mean, these are loaded, holy words of scripture, right? Loaded. So now let's make some applications as we close. We're going to make some applications out of the, the assumptions of the text, out of the options of the text. We're going to make some applications. Number one, all sin is debt that is owed to God. All sin is debt that is owed to God. In fact, in Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew specifically uses a financial word. Forgive us our debts. He uses the same word. Luke used the term hamartia, sin. Forgive us our sin. But Matthew, uniquely in the Lord's Prayer, for, and some, some of you might have memorized it and said it that way, right? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do you see? All sin is debt that is owed to God. Number two, application number two. If I won't confess my debt to Christ or in Christ, I will be held responsible for it. If I won't settle with Christ, you see the the picture of you've got to settle with the adversary before you get to court or it's too late. If I won't settle or confess my debt to Jesus Christ, I will be held responsible to God and I will go to prison and I will go to hell. That's all of that, right? If I will not settle my sin debt with Jesus Christ. And ask him, right, to take my debt on him, and he'll exchange that, great exchange, by granting me his righteousness, 2 Corinthians 5.21. If I won't confess on the way, it'll be too late. And then, then I'll have to pay for my, my sin debt in eternity in hell, right? So application number three, since there is no possible way to pay off my debt of sin to God in hell, Right. There is no possible way of paying off my debt of sin to God in hell. I'll be there forever. I'll be there forever. You, you, you cannot be your own redeemer. Right. You cannot be your own redeemer. Thus, the point of this tiny little teaching, make peace with God in Christ now while you still can. Make peace, reconcile, be reconciled to God, right? Be reconciled to God. Otherwise, the only other option. Now, make a, make a right choice, right? Make a just choice, Jesus says. Reconcile. You, you can reconcile your sin debt. Now, when we do it, evangelism explosion, those of you who did that ministry, you know, training with um, James Kennedy from you know, Florida, you know, people, we really don't understand sin all that well. Neither do we understand the quantity of sin. So Kennedy was the one who, of course, as I learned, you know, from him that says, ask people, how often in a day do you sin? How often? Because I don't think we actually would think it in a, in a term of numbers, right? You know, do, do you sin a hundred times a day? Or are you better? You sin 50, you know? <laughs> 10, 
Kennedy does this. And then he says, let's make it easy on us. Let's just say you sin three times a day, three times a day, because you're you are. You look like pretty good people. <laughs> three times a day times seven days a week is how many? Let's round it off and make it easy. Twenty times four weeks in a month. OK, let's round that one off to we'll round that up to, you know, the hundred mark, hundred, hundred sins a month times a year. OK, we're at twelve hundred times your age. <laughs> and that's three times three sins a day. We, we, we don't think of sin in that way. So neither do we, you know, think then of the glory of Christ that is willing to settle my entire sin debt, past, present, and future. Jesus is willing to take my entire sin debt. Don't think you're going to get off if you have to go to court before the Holy God. You will not get off. You will be imprisoned and your debt will never be paid. You cannot pay that. Christ bids us to be reconciled to God through him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the richness of, of these words of scripture that you've laid on our hearts and you put uh, before our eyes this evening as we looked at this personal teaching section again that you gave to your disciples. There's such richness and glory. I mean, we tremble a little bit more tonight, uh, Father, when we consider the divisions that are happening in our families, in our churches, in our communities, where Fathers and sons and mothers and daughters and in-laws are being divided because one is drawing closer to you and that causes others to repel. And our hearts are broken by that, Lord. We know it's not what you want. We know it's not what we want. And yet these divisions are the personal thorns of many of our families that were not unified Jesus in you, and we're sorry for that, Lord. And we pray your overwhelming grace, that same grace which won our rebellious hearts and drew us to you, would be the grace that would someday repair divisions and bring back um, those who are being currently repelled by your name, by your word, and by your gospel. God, we, we can't repair these things, but give us the words of scripture and the blessed invitation of the gospel to continue to invite people who are far from you to be reconciled, that our debt can be paid in full. Oh, Jesus, by you which you've done mightily for us at the cross, and people still today can find freedom from their debt of sin. Today, you, you, you are delaying your return that more might come in saving trust and repentance and in faith to you, Lord Jesus. May that happen in our days, in our families, and in our time. For Christ's sake, we ask this. Amen. Amen.